The cute PCBs in this episode were sponsored by PCBWay. Greetings Earthlings, if you follow the channel, you know that we are in the process of restoring the Apollo communications equipment and that we have recently acquired a box that we were previously missing called the Central Timing Equipment or a CTE for short. Unlike the other communication boxes that we have gotten so far, this one was welded shut so we could not open it up to take a look inside. But our friends at the company Lumafield let us use their incredible 3D X-ray machine to peer inside. We found it was chock full of electronics. To our surprise, it also had integrated circuits in it. And I thought only the Apollo Guidance computer and its attending coupling data unit had used ICs. Further research confirmed that the ICs were the very first Texas Instruments ones, some flip-flops and some end gates. In a previous episode, we explained how we made some mating connectors for it. Very surprisingly, they use metric dimensions. It is less surprising though, once you realize these military-grade connectors were made by the Deutsche company in Germany. Armed with our ersatz connectors, we are now ready to power up our clock. But before we get to that, let's familiarize ourselves with the CTE first. It was made by the Acronetics Division of General Time Corporation in Illinois. The General Time Corporation is perhaps better known for its West Clocks Big Ben Alarm Clocks, a popular consumer item from the early 1900s. But back to our CTE box. Its central role was to provide a large assortment of timing-related signals to the entire spacecraft some in the form of reference frequencies, some as periodic synchronization pulses, and of course a mission time clock. The CTE time reference is a temperature compensated crystal oscillator. We found the crystal in the X-rays. However, in normal operation, the CTE did not take its frequency reference from its internal oscillator. Instead, it was slave to the Apollo guidance computer clock, which had an oven control oscillator and was the most stable frequency source in the spacecraft with a measured drift of less than 24 milliseconds per day. The internal oscillator was then phase-locked to the AGC clock. Only in the event of a fault would the internal oscillator take over. From there, the oscillator frequency is divided to 512 kHz. That 512 kHz signal is then passed on to the pre-modulation processor which we just powered up in the previous episode. It is used to generate the 1.024 MHz and the 1.25 MHz subcarriers for the downlink, and the communication system will not work without it. In the previous episode, we had to use my HP frequency source as a substitute, but if our CTE works, we'll be able to use the real thing instead. That same 512 kHz also drives the BCM telemetry equipment the box that measures just about everything in the spacecraft and sends data back to Earth, filling the screens of the Houston mission controllers. The signal is then further divided to 6.4 kHz. This frequency is sent to the three power supply inverters, which transform the DC power from the fuel cells into standard avionics 400 Hz, 115 volts AC to power much of the spacecraft. After further division, a 10 Hz signal is produced for the timers. These are the actual clocks presented to the astronauts. There are two of them. The mission elapsed time clock is near the center of the control panel. But there is also an event timer that counts up to 99 minutes and 99 seconds. It is used primarily during the boost phase to time the critical launch events. Note that the CTE just gives the 10 Hz reference pulses to advance these two clocks, which each have their own independent digital counter. Both are capable to revert to their less precise backup oscillator if the CTE fails. Back to the CTE. After further division, we arrive at the 1 Hz, the seconds counter. This signal is primarily used by the PCM telemetry system to synchronize each frame of data. And finally, we have arrived at our space clock proper. 
The CTE has an internal digital clock that counts seconds, minutes, hours and days. It outputs the clock value in both 32-bit parallel code and in serial form. The parallel form is used by the PCM telemetry. It is incorporated into every data frame as a timestamp. The serial clock data is used by the SIMBAY photographic and scientific equipment on the side of the service module, along with the seconds pulse. Unlike the clock on the control panel, the CTE's internal clock is under control from the ground. It can be set and reset via the up data link. In fact, we should be able to set it remotely using our up data test box and its anachronistic paper tape. Last but not least, the CTE produces a 10 seconds long pulse every 10 minutes. This goes to the weirdest destination. It connects to the ECS, the Environmental Control System. It is used to periodically activate a pump that drains the water collected from the space suits. It took me a while to find the other end of the wire, but I was rewarded by this magnificent drawing of the cabin oxygen control system with the space suit at the left. In case you wonder, the signal connects to a solenoid that uses oxygen pressure to move a piston in the suit water collection tank, which pushes the collected water towards the waste system. Never anything simple in Apollo. One more thing. If you look at a more detailed diagram, you realize that everything in the clock is redundant for reliability. Actually, most of it is triplicated. For every single division stage, there are three division stages in parallel. A voter circuit then picks the majority signal at the output. This way, if any individual divider stage were to fail, the clock would still work properly. The power supply is of course duplicated also, as we could clearly see in the X-rays. That certainly explains why the box has so many components. Alright, enough of the theory. Now that we understand it thoroughly, let's see if we can make the CTE work again. So Mike, you think you discovered something on my CTE box? Yeah, uh, I was looking very closely at this connector just to, you know, sort of understand how the pins were laid out and the, the light happened to catch it such that out of the corner of my eye, I, I noticed that this, this sort of brown area is where the part tag used to be. Um, and it looks like a lot of the numbers on the part tag were stamped, which means they went through the part tag and are still kind of readable in this area. I put it under the microscope with some side illumination and you can really see it. There. And that's how we learned that the box was made in 1969. You got your boards? And we got some boards. Oh, a magic gray boards. color. Ooh, pretty. Yeah, that will be just perfect. Okay. Looks like that'll work. So Eric has wired his connector breakout. Fantastic. And we think we have found a pinout. So this box gives all kind of reference frequency signal, the main one being the 512 kilohertz. Uh, but then it gives also the time in, right. in BCD. So, but uh, what, what you just have the uh, 512 hooked up, and then it's welded. So there's nothing we can do about it. It either works or doesn't work. So, um, so I just turn it on, I guess, and we should have 512 kilohertz. We do. Oh, it makes a noise. Is it it's okay. the box that makes a noise. We should have, should be 512 ACRMS cycle frequency counter. All right. 512 kilohertz. Woo! 0 0.00. Nice. You got your money's worth. <laughs> yes. We hooked it up to the frequency meter and it has three zeros in it. Not bad. That's a good 512 kilohertz. Yeah, this is the, the less accurate backup clock. <laughs> right. Right. right, 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 right. That's the backup clock. Normally it, it clocks on the AGC, mm -hmm. which has a super duper clock.
and it looks like our uh, some of our signals are coming out pretty well. You get this is the uh, second bit A. So here we can see the seconds are incrementing. Mm -hmm. And then on channel two, we have the timecode data. Yeah, it looks like iRig. It's a pretty slow uh, frame rate. Should be a one second frame. And we figured out the time clock. So the sync is uh, those two long ones. This is the seconds in BCD, four bits for the lower one. A narrow pulse is a zero, a longer pulse is a one. Then a longer bit for the separation to the minutes, and then you have the same thing for the minutes. So right now it's two and three. Uh, we, we've powered it for 32 minutes. All right, yeah. Done a bit more wiring and uh, wire it into my BCD27 segment decoder. It's counting. <laughs> okay, let's right. do a second digit. Oh, it's counting! This is Apollo time. Let's see when it does the rollover. So the idea is to do that with a bank of mixing tubes, of course. Of course. 59. Yo. There we go. Okay, yes. 60. No Y2K problem. Yes. <laughs> Works very well. Hello, so if you followed one of the last videos, we restored this Nixie uh, counter to perfection. 10 megahertz, 9 megahertz, 8 megahertz. Uh, but we are going to hack it back because I want to use it for a purpose it was not intended to, uh, which is to be the display for my Apollo CTE clock. And for that, I'm going to reuse the display and make a reversible modification. Conveniently, this instrument has a connector at the back that outputs all the BCD bits from each Nixie digit. I am going to use that in reverse to input BCD bits from the clock instead. I'm going to use that as an input from the clock instead. So the it comes from the to the Nixie board from the wiring out there to these, and these are usually outputs. So you can see how it's done on the schematics here. You have the decade counters. They go to a buffer chip. Half of it goes to the Nixie drivers. These are the Nixies, and they are. Eight, eight Nixies, so you have eight times the same circuit. And half of it goes over here, which is that connector. And what I'm going to do is replace every one of those ICs, which are just buffers, and make it so that this becomes an input and it inputs into the driver IC and it just be be basically ignores uh, the native inputs. And to do that cleanly, we're just going to remove all the ICs, socket them, and I'm going to replace this one with a fake IC made out of a little chip on this little PCB that PCBWay made for me, and it, which is basically that. It turns the, what used to be outputs, uh, turns them into inputs, and wraps them around to the Nixie drivers. So this way we'll be able to drive this display from outside and if we want to revert the instrument uh, to its original state, we just take these fake ICs out and put the real ones back in. And these ICs are a bit, little bit tiny, so there's a million ways you can do them. You can do them by hand uh, without the solder mask, but I splurge and got the solder mask because it's going to be useful for any SOIC. So I'm going to use that to put the solder at the right place. There we go. Starbucks card. Okay. Yeah, perfect. And here you go. That's the advantage of doing it with a mask. It's clean from the get go, but. You don't have to do that, you can just splatter it on and do it with a big soldering iron.
Beep. Okay, that's the prototype. Yeah, I go. Melty, melty. Try it now. I go. Looks very good. First attempt is a success. And then these just fit right down on top, just like that. There you go. See that? So there they are. They're ready for soldering. Okay, go for it, man. Okay. You kept the big tip. <laughs> Makes it a little bit easier. Oh, really? You prefer it? Yeah. Okay, so then we plug all of our eight fake ICs in. Well, we have to clean the flux off first. Oh, yeah, that's, that's true. the water soluble. So. Oh, yeah. We have to rinse that. That's the red stuff. You, uh, It's the cleanest because it goes out with water, but you have to rinse it off. I hope that works because I never tested it. <laughs> we'll just, find out. I just made that up. I just made that up. And... Okay. Look at that. Well, that's a clean modification if you ask me. There you go. Very nice. Okay, let's try it. Um, we have hooked it up so, okay, you should do a, a valid one. Okay. Oh, I didn't do a prototype on that one. So. Oh, yeah, I have oh. a number. Okay. All those things. Five. Oh, six. Seven. Eight. We have another one that lit up, nine. But that, that may be because that's a random. Uh, eight, nine, right, because 10 is blank. Yeah, uh, yeah, it should be. So it should blank when you have a, a non valid BCD combination. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay, so we have the decimal point that we have to figure out, and I think the other ones are just lighting up because they're connected to nothing. Yeah, if I put my finger on it. Oh, yeah, 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 there you go. It's the CMOS. Alright. Alright, I have finished my moderately complicated cable. That's uh, Eric's adapter. And I haven't wired everything, just the uh, BCD out for the clock interface to the HP thing, power, and the, uh, that's usually that's connected to the update link, but that's uh, to try to see if I can set it to a particular time. So, that should do it. Okay, I'm all hooked up. Um, set at 28 volts. Let's turn it on, see if we didn't break it. Ooh, did it work? Oh, because I'm not, I got scared. I'm not hooked up. But I should see 512 kilohertz over there. I don't. Minus plus. Okay, I do hear the Supply going. Am I at the wrong test point? Oh, here we go. All right. Um, and it has some glitches in it. It's from the test port, so I'm not sure what to expect from there. And then let's turn it on. Oh, yeah, it's counting. We have Apollo mission time. All right, let's see if it turns over at 60. Where's my little paddle board? Over here, buried. 55, 60. Hey, yeah, we're counting. So let me try my little paddle thing. See if I can add minutes. I can sure add minutes, but what about hours? I cannot add hours. What about days? I can add days. I can add days. And I cannot add hours, but I can add minutes. Can I reset it? I have a reset button. Yep, reset sure works. 
Okay, let me figure out why I cannot set uh, whatever it was, the, the days or the hours. Okay, I think I repaired it. The my NASA document says your set hours should be on M5. And it wasn't connected, but now if I try it, M5 and Eric's adapter has everything written on it. There we go, okay. So that should fix it. Okay, let's try it again with feeling. There we go, 512 kilohertz. We are counting seconds. I'm going to try my little paddle now. I can set the, the seconds, of course. The minutes. Let's see if we fix the errors. We did. And the days. So it's one day, five errors, seven minutes, and a little bit over 30 seconds in the mission. We have the Apollo clock working. Part of it, there is much more to it. It does the uh, serial code, which we checked last time. But uh, I think that's an appropriate display for the clock. With nice mixies. And voila, our CTE is ready to be integrated in the communications setup with a nice Nixie display to boot. See you in the next episode.